And a very good day to you and welcome to the program. We've entitled this program, Who is This Man? And I'm going to go straight to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and we're going to start reading from verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Maybe that's a question God's asking you today, sir. Who do you say that he is? There are some people that will tell you he was a very good man and God came to live inside of him. See, that's not the truth. And there are some that will even preach it from the platform. He was a lovely man. He was a helpful man, but... He wasn't God, see? Simon Peter answered and he said to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Emmanuel, God with us. I want to say to you right at the outset of this program, what we believe is that Jesus Christ is God made flesh. He's not a good man and the Holy Spirit came to live in him. No, no, no. He is God. See, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? John chapter 1, verse 1. Remember, how can a virgin girl become pregnant? It's impossible. And yet, Mary was chosen by God for Jesus to be born through her. Okay? Remember, the archangel Gabriel came and told her. And uh, yes, indeed, the most blessed of all women. So Jesus is God made flesh, Emmanuel. And a lot of us, maybe one or two of you watching this program, don't honestly believe that. Please do believe that. Because if you don't, then you cannot call yourself a Christian. The very term believer tells you who we are. We are those of the way. See, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. He asked Peter, who do you say I am? You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Not you are a good man. No. So that's who he is. You know that um, I've been reading, reading a lot of C.S. Lewis's books lately. And I really esteem his writings. A very serious man. Started off as an atheist and then became a Christian. And he said about Jesus... He is either God or he is a complete lunatic. Now, those are heavy words. He's nothing in between because what he claims to be makes him either God or a madman. And I know that he's God because there's nobody else ever claimed that. You see, Muhammad never claimed that. Muhammad never ever said that he was Allah. In fact, if he did say that, he would have died. Okay? I want to say to you that Buddha never said that he was God. No, he did not. See? I want to say to you that you can go to many of these gods and you'll find their bones in the tomb because they're still there. They were human beings. Okay? But when you go to the garden tomb or to the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, in Israel, you'll find that that tomb is empty. Why? Because he's not dead. He's alive. Why? Because he's the son of God. And he prophesied that that would happen. And Isaiah prophesied that 800 years before Jesus was even born. He prophesied that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Emmanuel, God with us. He prophesied it. The wise men, where did they come from? I know one of them came from Ethiopia. I've been to Ethiopia with my wife, Jill. I went there. It was a wonderful holiday that I had there. It takes three months to get to Israel if you're walking or going on a camel. And who showed these wise men where God was going to be born? A star. You say, come on, Angus, that's an old one. That's what the Bible tells us. See? 
So without faith, you cannot believe that Jesus is God made flesh. But I'm telling you, I know, I know because I know he is the son of God. Peter said in Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You see, our confidence has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in our abilities, not in the governments. Look how the governments are crumbling all over the world because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God made flesh. If they did, they wouldn't be doing that. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, For we are confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you and me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, until the day of his return. We are not putting our trust, are we, in the world? No, we are not putting our trust in politics. Definitely not. We are not putting our trust in the weather. I'm a farmer. The weather is so upside down now, it's never been like this before. We are not putting our trust in the health system, are we? Because they don't know what to do. They really don't. We are not putting our trust in our government pensions when we get old because they just take them away, don't they? So where is our trust? Is it in the edu education system? Definitely not. Our trust is in God and in God alone. And that is what makes me so excited. He will do it for you. Why? Because he's done it for me. And he is no respecter of persons. And furthermore, he will do it in and through us. He'll work with us. I love him so much. I'm living my dream at the moment. I'm so excited. I am preaching on faith. Okay? That's what I'm preaching. And Jesus Christ says, unless you believe, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. He takes a little child. He says, unless you become as this little child, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me qualify that. Not to say that we must become childish. Not at all. We must become childlike. I have 11 grandchildren. And I can take those little grandchildren, sit them on my lap, and I'll tell them stories and they'll believe them because they've got childlike faith. Okay, they don't question it. I want to tell you a personal story that happened to me. When I first gave my life to the Lord, within three months, I had started preaching the gospel. That's right. I had the most wonderful congregation of old people, who really loved me. And I think they put up with all kinds of things with me. <laughs> I think I was preaching heresy, apostasy, and all the other seas. But they just loved me. And they smiled and encouraged me. And then they corrected me afterwards. The little church in the main street of town. That's where I got saved. And after three months, the reverend was so kind as to trust me with his congregation. Now he said, I'm going to give you the service on the Sunday morning, Angus. And I was beside myself. I was so excited, so scared, so anxious. I was preparing that sermon for about six weeks. I had written 15 pages, 15, one five, I'll never forget it, of notes. <laughs> I had virtually memorized them off by heart. On the morning it arrived, I'd been running a little coffee bar for some children, young people, before that, and the little, we'd formed a little band, and they were going to come and sing a song, yeah, with me before I started to preach. It was wonderful. So we were all around the back of the church in the vestry, and all the elders were there laying hands on us and praying for us. I must admit, I was a little bit disappointed. One old man came to me, and he said to me, well, son, he says, get in there and give it to them. I've done my bit. I'll never forget that as a brand new Christian. I didn't say anything, but I felt in my heart to say, Sir, how can you do your bit? How can you ever, ever hope to repay God for what he did for you? Anyway, that's besides the point. So we came in through the church. I'll never forget through the door right next to the pulpit, that green, I think it was blue velvet uh, curtain was open. The door was open. And in we walked up the stairs into the pulpit. And I saw the people all sitting there. And my wife, Jill, was sitting right at the back. And the main entrance was at the back. 
And the minister introduced me, and after we'd, we'd sung a, a few hymns, and then it was for me to start. And he said, I want to introduce you to the farmer. And of course, I was shaking. Remember now, we're talking about Jesus. Who is this man? Well, he's the one that made Paul probably the greatest apostle that's ever lived. He's the one who took a fisherman who was a blasphemer and made him into an incredible leader of the church. He took a doubter by the name of Thomas, made him into an incredible martyr for the faith. This is the man I'm talking about. He specializes in taking donkeys and making them into racehorses. I remember a preacher coming from overseas years and years ago. He said, you'll never, ever change a donkey into a racehorse. He was wrong. God takes donkeys and makes them into racehorses because those donkeys will never touch his glory. Anyway, I introduced myself and I had my notes in front of me and page one was introduction, so I read it nicely. Then I turned over and what was waiting for me? Page 15, <laughs> which was the conclusion, the benediction. And there was 13 pages missing, 13. Well, I looked, I didn't know what to do. The minister was sitting right next to me. I could have handed over to him at any time. But you see that little band had just been singing a song. I've never forgotten it. Maybe you've heard it. Here comes Jesus. See him walking on the water. He'll lift you up and he'll help you to stand. All about faith. It made me cry, actually. I looked to the back of the congregation. There was my little wife and I just looked at her and she knew exactly. I just said, you know, I don't have my notes. I, I didn't say it. But, you know, when you've been married for a long time, you don't have to talk. She ran out the back of the church to the motor car, to our pickup, thinking that maybe I'd drop the notes in the pickup. She ran back. She stood at the back of the church. I'll never forget it. She just went like this. So I must have left them on the farm. That was 15 kilometers from town. And that was my decisive moment. That was one of the most important moments in my entire walk with Christ. Because my subject was faith. That's right. Now I had a choice. I could have just said, I'm sorry, folks. I've left my notes at home. The minister would have carried on with the service. I guarantee if I'd said that, I wouldn't be preaching to you today. And I've now been preaching for 41 years. I've preached all over the world. I've preached in stadiums, in open air areas, in football stadiums. I've preached in churches. I've preached in theaters all over the earth because of the goodness of the man from Galilee, Jesus Christ, who said, Come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. Learn of me. And I think you'll find that in Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. I want to say to you today that if you put your trust in this man called Jesus, I can tell you something now. He is not a lunatic. He is not a madman. He is God. And he says, if you put your trust in him, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Well, I preached that sermon. I preached it without any notes. And you know, up until this day, when I go, it's, it's almost like it happens every time. I can be in Newlands uh, Rugby Stadium or Cricket Stadium in Cape Town, or I can be up in the northern part of our country at... Um, Paul Aquani at the stadium. And when I open my Bible, a wind comes and blows all my notes away. <laughs> it's like the Lord says, you don't need those. And then I just open my heart to God. And Jesus talks through me. What about you today? Where do you stand at the moment? Are you trusting the Lord? Are you believing that he is indeed the son of the living God? Or are you saying, I don't really believe that? Well, I want to tell you, if you don't believe that, he can't help you. Our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in a person. And he's part of the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His name is Jesus. And I want to tell you, not once, many times, he said to them, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What does that tell you? 
It tells you that he's God. That's what it tells you. And that is why they crucified him for that very reason. And yet they saw him walking on water. Please tell me, write to me if you know, if you've ever met a person who's walked on top of the water. I'm not talking about stones that are just under the surface of the water. I'm talking about on the water. I refuse to believe that any man can do that. It's impossible. Do you know that uh, the, 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 the Lake of Galilee is 13 kilometers across, 21 kilometers long. Jesus walked 13 kilometers to the other side of the lake. Not 13 feet, 13 kilometers. Who is this man that he said to Lazarus after his body was decaying? He'd been in the tomb for four days. Do you know that in the Middle East, if you die today, they bury you today? Because it's so hot there, the body starts to decay. Four days, Martha and Mary said, Lord, please don't go in there. And he called him out, totally resurrected. Who can do that? Only God. Who can feed 5,000 men, not including women and children, with two little sardines and five barley loaves of bread? Who can do that? Only God. God can do that. Who can prophesy and tell a woman, and not even a Jewish woman, a Samaritan, her whole life story, that the man that she's with is not her husband, and she's had so many husbands before, and name them. And then she runs back into the village, and the whole village is converted by Jesus sitting by the well while he's waiting for the disciples to bring the food, and he told her her whole life story. Oh, folks, I want to tell you, I know that my Redeemer lives. I don't hope he lives. I know he lives because he's been living in my heart for 41 years. He has never forsaken me. Never once has he let me down. Everything he said he would do, he's done. But he requires one thing from you and I, and that's faith, to believe in him. And that's why I asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? The people say that you this and you that, but who do you say? You are the Messiah. And if you can say that with me today, I want to tell you, your life will be totally turned around and transformed. There was one of the fathers of the faith. His name was Polycarp. Polycarp is one of my heroes. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. And the Romans were coming to get him. And his friend said to him, please, please run. Go for it, because they're going to catch you. He said, I'm not scared. He was 86 years old, Polycarp. And when they arrived, he welcomed them into his home. Can you believe that? And he cooked a meal for the enemy. And he fed them. And he said, now you can take me. And they, they didn't want to take him. They said to him, Polycarp, please, just deny that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our Roman gods, and we'll let you go. And you can die peacefully because you're an old man. He said, I can't. And so they started taking him to the arena. And one of the proconsuls came up in his chariot, and he said to the old man, get up on our chariot. And as they were riding into the arena, he said to Polycarp, reconsider. We don't want to kill you. We don't want to burn you at the stake. Just deny Christ as the Messiah and we'll let you go. He said, for 86 years, he has never, ever once disappointed me. He has never failed me. How could I do that now? They were so angry with him, they pushed the old man off the chariot and broke his leg. And he went into that stadium with a broken leg. They tied him to the stake. He said, you don't have to tie me. I'm not running away. And they put wood around him. And they started to light the fire. And the fire was burning right around this man of God. And it never burnt him. The flames were going over him. Eventually, they sent a gladiator in with a sword to kill him. And as the gladiator pierced his heart, the blood came out and put the fire out. I want to tell you something now, folks. A man will not die in that manner for someone who is not God. And I, I could tell you so many stories about martyrs who have died for their faith. And you know, all they had to do was to deny Christ. What about the 21 martyrs in um, Libya? Just ordinary construction workers. They, they weren't even pastors. 
but they were Coptic Christians from Egypt. All they had to do was to deny Christ and they could have lived. Not one of them denied Christ. And you know, ISIS was so foolish. They thought if they could capture this on video, then the Christians in the world would be so scared that they would turn from God and did the exact opposite. You see, there's a saying that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's exactly how it works. And they, they actually filmed the whole thing where each one had his head cut off. I'm not talking about 100 years ago. I'm talking about a few years back. Why? Because Jesus is God made flesh. Now, I want to pray for you because maybe you've had doubts and maybe you've thought to yourself, well, maybe he's just another one of the gods. Maybe he's just a good man and, and God came and lived inside of him. No, 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 no. He is God. Yes, God made flesh. Let us pray. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name for my friends. And I'm giving them an opportunity to acknowledge publicly. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're sitting in your, in your house, in your sitting room. Maybe you're in hospital and maybe you're sick. He can heal the sick too. Maybe you're in prison and you're feeling so depressed. Today, if you acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, he'll change your life. Pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, that's right. I acknowledge you as the Son of God. You are God made flesh. And I thank you, Lord, that you've said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Who else can do that but only God? And I thank you, Lord, that uh, you'll give us the faith to believe that you're coming back very soon to take us to be with you in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there we have it. You know what to do now. Go out now and tell the first three people that you meet in the street that you have made a commitment to a living God, not to some person who is imitating God, but God himself, Jesus Christ, the soon and coming Messiah. I want to be quite honest with you. I cannot wait to see him. This world holds very little for me. I am a cloud watcher. He's promised us he's coming back in the clouds. And uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe today. God bless you. Goodbye.